At the end of the 5th century BC, in 401, a prince of Persia, Cyrus the Younger, was killed at the Battle of Kunaxa near present-day Baghdad, facing off against his brother Artaxerxes II for control of the Persian throne, backing him up with the 10,000, a mercenary force composed mainly of Greeks, and following their defeat, the 10,000 famously marched back home. Specialists in Greek history have debated the exact route and have tried to reconstruct it over the past two centuries, but no matter the exact path, the 10,000 marched through a territory which, just over 250 years earlier, was the core of an empire which stretched from the shores of the Aegean, northeast across Anatolia, and into modern Armenia, and which possibly touched the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains. At one point, the army probably used a road constructed by this state, and they passed by mounds which were once mountaintop fortresses. Xenophon did not know the name of the state, and where he mentions these structures, he ascribed them to the Assyrians. The same went for other ancient historians, and the most prominent of all the fortresses, the Fortress of Van, was described as Assyrian by the late antique historian Moses of Korin, a tradition which continued into the Middle Ages. We know this civilization as Urartu, and so did the Assyrians, whose records comprise a significant bulk of our evidence for them, but in their own accounts the Urartians were often referred to as the Bianili. For a little over two centuries, between about 860 and about 590 BC, it dominated much of Anatolia, and it posed a serious challenge to the Assyrians farther south. It was one of the most powerful states in the Near East during the early Iron Age, and its kings constructed urban centers, roadways, and the famous mountaintop fortresses, which have attracted the attention of archaeologists. By the 6th century, within about 100 years, nearly all traces of it had vanished, to be rediscovered, literally almost by accident, in the 1820s. Urartu was, in more ways than one, a civilization lost to time. Paul Zemansky, one of the foremost experts on Urartu, sums it up nicely when he writes that the transition from the world of the Urartian Empire to the one which Xenophon saw involved an eradication of human memory as well as physical structures. Dealing with the history of this state is incredibly difficult, so this video will be a broad sweep not only of that history, but also of what those problems are. The discovery of this civilization is, actually, probably best classified as an accident. Not because it was never going to be discovered, the development of history and archaeology as modern disciplines, and the influx of scholars into the Near East probably would have made its discovery occur at some point, but because the initial discovery of Urartu and its introduction to the modern world was done by somebody who was not supposed to be in the vicinity of any of its ruins. The main Urartian citadel overlooks Lake Van, located in eastern Turkey, and it contained a number of inscriptions written in cuneiform. Greco-Roman historians and historians from the medieval and early modern periods certainly knew of this writing, but they apparently assumed it was Assyrian. After all, ancient historians like Herodotus and Xenophon made no mention of a state called Urartu, and medieval Armenian historians who saw the complex attributed it to Assyria, as was tradition by that point, because in their minds, who else could have built such a structure? In 1827, however, a German philologist who was interested in the Persian language attempted to enter Persia, but he was blocked on various grounds, and so for one reason or another, he found himself in the Ottoman Empire, in the shadow of Fortress Van. Being interested in language, the scholar copied the inscriptions, but was unfortunately murdered before he could return to Europe. Around the same time, British archaeologists had begun to excavate Assyrian cities, and in so doing, they uncovered Assyrian cuneiform tablets, and the translation of the Behistun inscription in the 1840s, a trilingual Persian inscription written in Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian, helped pave the way for the translation of those Assyrian texts, which were written in Akkadian, because Babylonian was a variant of that language. And although the inscriptions from Van were written using the same cuneiform, it became clear very quickly that the language itself was not Akkadian, which probably meant that all previous historians were incorrect and that this massive site was not Assyrian. It quite likely belonged to some unknown civilization. The discovery of Hurrian texts and their gradual translation made it clear that whatever language was used for these particular inscriptions around Lake Van was related to the Hurrian language. And the further discovery of bilingual inscriptions in Akkadian and this language also helped translation efforts and slowly the language we know as Urartian was deciphered. 
Hurrian and Urartian are so closely related that philologists now recognize huro urartian as a language family with some tentative relation to Caucasian languages. So, by the very early 20th century, the civilization of Urartu had begun to rise from the mists of time. Following the Bronze Age collapse in the 12th century BC, the political situation in much of the Near East stabilized by the start of the first millennium, and we quickly get complex societies and states showing up once again in the archaeological record. By the 9th century BC, we begin to have textual sources that deal with things outside of super-local events, and by the 7th century, Assyria was so powerful and so dominating that it becomes possible to essentially study the textual record of most of the Near East by using only Assyrian sources. Although Assyria came to dominate much of the first millennium Near East, it did coexist with other states, notably Elam, Babylonia, Israel, Judah, various Aramean states in Syria, Phrygia, Lydia, and last but not least, Urartu. Dealing with any state that is not Assyria poses its own set of challenges because many of the textual sources we have are Assyrian, Thus events are from the Assyrian perspective, and thus they're concerned with things that the Assyrians cared about, so we have to rely on evidence that often dates to just prior or just after the existence of these other states, and while we do have plenty of archaeological evidence, the histories that we can reconstruct, especially for Urartu, are uneven and the chronology unfortunately has a number of gaps. Our major list of Urartian kings, for example, doesn't even come from one of their own texts. Instead, our source is Assyrian, so how much something like that can be trusted is just one of the issues confronting anybody examining the history of this civilization. Broadly speaking, we have several hundred surviving Urartian texts, but we only have three which we can describe as extensive in any sense of the term. The first is an inscription from Fortress Van detailing the achievements of King Argisti I, located next to his rock-cut tomb. The second is an inscription also from the same site listing the accomplishments of King Sarduri II, and the third is a general inscription detailing with the accomplishments of King Ruga. Outside of that, we have hundreds of texts whose lines are broken and whose entire length is maybe one or two sentences or just a few words. Of these sources, only 60 run to 20 lines, the most extensive in the group, which is why Assyrian texts essentially have to be used alongside them. Additionally, there are four bilingual inscriptions located in the Zagros Mountains and associated with a state known as Musasir, a city of incredible importance to Urartu which will come up again later in this video, although the location is not certain. And lastly, there are a number of bronze objects and clay seals which have anything ranging from a single word to a complete sentence written on them. So, to sum it all up, although there are hundreds of Urartian texts, dealing with the history of Urartu is nothing like dealing with, say, the history of the United States. What I mean by that is that for the latter example, a historian could spend their entire life working in one or maybe two archives, and probably never grasp all the documentary evidence. A historian or archaeologist working with the Urartian past, however, could probably read all of the text we currently know about. In more ways than one, that is both a blessing and a curse. That issue, the size of the Urartian archive currently in existence and the subsequent reliance upon Assyrian sources, leads us to the early history of Urartu, but with it comes one more problem. Who exactly does the term Urartu apply to? In the late Bronze Age, the region of eastern Anatolia in the Armenian highlands was home to a number of small states wedged between three larger ones. The Hittite Empire, the Assyrian Empire, and the Mitanni Empire. This area was not so much a frontier zone as it was a buffer zone between the three, who exerted varying degrees of influence over the smaller states located in the region. The first textual references to political organization in the area come from 13th century Assyrian texts, which mention a territory and an associated people they call the Nairi, and another they call the Uratri. The latter is probably a variant of the name Urartu, and it's thought by some scholars that Urartri was actually part of the territory of Nairi prior to the establishment of Urartu as its own state, but this is countered by another argument that due to the Assyrians treating the two as distinct entities, they are not necessarily related. This is, however, made more complicated by the fact that early Urartian inscriptions refer to their own territory by the name of Nairi, and also by the name of Bianili. Other sources make it fairly clear that in the 13th century, and then into the 12th century, the region was fairly linguistically diverse. 
and the archaeology reflects a diversity of material culture. So the problem then is that the Urartian language is understood by scholars today, but it's not certain if the term Urartu itself refers to a specific ethnic group which conquered other ethnicities, and thus that the speakers form the bulk of the population, or if it should be better understood as referring to a multi-ethnic state governed by a small group of elites who spoke the language, which welded the whole thing together through military force, in which case the term might be better understood in political and not cultural or ethnic terms. The fact that the state which the Assyrians called Urartu seems to have just come out of nowhere, and which probably had a change of dynasties at some point, seems to point toward the latter idea, but it's still not entirely clear. So, it was into this northern border region that Assyrian armies pushed in the 13th century BC, and as portions of it gradually came under Assyrian control, colonies were established, population transfer ensued, and the Assyrians planned for long-term control. The late Bronze Age collapse in the 12th century, however, radically altered these plans. The northeastern portion of the empire suffered attacks from a people the Assyrians called the Mushki, although it's not clear who exactly these people were. Between 1114 and 1076 BC, Assyria was ruled by Tiglath Pileser I, who repelled these attacks, but 20 years later, by about 1056, the Assyrians had largely pulled out of Anatolia after suffering further setbacks. Not all of the Assyrian governors or client rulers in the colonies pulled back with them, however. Instead, some of them established their own small political units, but in the late 10th and early 9th centuries, the Assyrians, now fully recovered and fully reinvigorated, sent armies into the region to reconquer it and bring it back under their control. The response on the part of some of these local rulers seems to have been to flee. Specifically, they fled to the northeast to the region the Assyrians knew as Nairi, and then they conquered the area around Lake Van. Our main chronology for Urartu comes from an Assyrian list of kings, and that list states that the first king was a man named Arame who reigned between 860 and 843 BC. For the history of this civilization, the first few decades and the last few decades, so roughly between 860 and 830, and about 630 and about 580, are not exactly overflowing with evidence. We don't even know when the state officially ended. Various sources list kings as existing in the years we today would understand to be 590, 585, and 580, and even down to the 560s, there is some evidence, but those years are open to challenge, and to make matters worse, the range of some of these kings seem to overlap, or at least to be confused, in the source material. What is known is that around 860, some new complex state began to be constructed around Lake Van, with two early capitals. The first was Sagunia, and then it was moved to Arzkun, before being finalized in the city of Tushpa, on the shores of Lake Van. And we know this was a new state because there are no precedents for something this complex in the material record of the region or in the textual sources, but this is also where the lack of evidence becomes problematic. The third king, a man named Sarduri I, was the son of the second king, Lutipri, and neither of them may have been related to the first king, Arame, or Aramu, as at least one recording has it written. Sarduri appears to be the one who was largely responsible for building the fortress overlooking Lake Van, and he was the one who was responsible for moving the capital to Tushpa. Sarduri's inscriptions are largely the reason that scholars think that Urartu developed, at least partially, out of an Assyrian context, because the language that Sarduri employs, such as calling himself Great Shepherd or He Who Does Not Fear the Battle, are Assyrian phrases and monarchical terminology, especially the phrase King of the Four Corners, meaning, of course, King of the World, an ancient title in the Near East by that time. Around this period, however, sometime between the reign of Lutipri and the reign of the fourth king, Ishpuini, there was probably a change of dynasties. We think this was the case because there are some case endings and some other quirks of grammar with the royal names that suddenly stop matching between those three reigns, so roughly between 844 and 828 BC, and then after 828 BC, they start being very consistent. Sorduri, or Ishpuini, also introduced a new god to the kingdom, and this is also why scholars think there may have been a change in the ruling dynasty. The deity's name is Haldi, and his major temple was located at Musasir, a prominent city which formed part of a buffer zone between Assyria and Urartu, located somewhere in the Zagros Mountains. 
As far as the location is concerned, that's about it. The city still has not been located, but based on where the text said it was, archaeologists think it was located somewhere either in northeastern Iraq or in southwestern Iran. There is a similarity in material culture in the region dating to the time period in question, and we have two Urartian inscriptions in the region which lay along what looks like a trade route, and the site of Gerdi Dasht has revealed fortifications which look very similar to Assyrian art that depicts the city, and there is a destruction layer in the site's stratigraphy which probably means it was destroyed while it was inhabited. We know the Assyrians eventually conquered Musasir, which has led some archaeologists to argue that this is probably the city, but it is still something of an open question because we don't have any documentation. We just have some ruins, but those ruins could belong to any ancient city. It doesn't have to be Musasir. Because Urartian kings began to make their way to the city to receive blessings and to worship Haldi in the main temple, it's thought that if there was indeed a change of dynasties, then the new dynasty came from this region. Indeed, some scholars think that one of the early Urartian capitals was near Musasir, and when Sarduri came to the throne, he made the choice to center the kingdom on Lake Van. Despite the importance, however, the city retained its independence, although given the centrality of the religion, the city became a key ally of Urartu. The fourth king, Ispuini, is largely considered to be the real architect of the state in terms of political and organizational structures. During his reign, the kingdom began and largely completed a series of large hydraulic projects designed to boost agricultural production, which drastically increased his kingdom's wealth, and it is with the creation of a bureaucracy and a corps of scribes to help administer all of this that archaeologists can actually trace the shift from Assyrian as the official administrative language to bilingualism to eventually just the Urartian language. Ishpuini also launched wars on many different fronts, including apparently the conquest of Musasir, but most notably in two areas. The first was in the direction of Lake Urmia, which was conquered and turned into a major agricultural area. The second was either associated with Lake Urmia or was nearby. It's a region known in ancient sources as Gilzanu, located somewhere in modern northwestern Iran, which was a tributary of Assyria. And it's the conquest of this region that attracted the attention of the Assyrians, which of course led to a war in 819, but unfortunately we don't know who won because both sides claim victory and we have little evidence for the conflict. The kings after Mishpuini, like the predecessor, also waged numerous wars. In particular, these campaigns were directed against their northern borders in roughly a broad arc from eastern Anatolia to the Caucasus Mountains. Wars were launched and directed against the Ituini, the Dioahui, and the Edequahi, people who controlled regions with strong commercial links to the steppe and to the Iranian plateau. Etiuni was the major threat around 800, and Urartian kings claimed numerous victories, and they claimed to have captured thousands, including 17,000 people in one expedition. Like the Assyrians before them, they engaged in massive population transfers to build aqueducts, irrigation projects, etc., with the total number of people transferred over the span of their history potentially reaching one million, roughly on par with what the Assyrians did, and they built fortresses in the area to solidify control, but it was never fully conquered, and we know of frequent rebellions and Urartian campaigns in the area. We also have some evidence that they campaigned in a land called Kolha, which is believed to be cultus in modern Georgia. If that association is correct, then this is the farthest north that Urartian armies went. At the same time, Urartu waged war against Assyria, and they appear to have been frequently victorious, invading northern Iraq numerous times. The problem that we run into, however, between roughly 800 BC and about 760 BC, is that the chronology for the kings is not certain. We think, based on Assyrian records, that the order runs as follows. Menua succeeded Ispuini, reigning between 800 and 785. Argishti succeeded Menua, reigning between 785 and 760. And Sarduri II succeeded Argishti, reigning between 764 and 735. The problem that we run into is that the surviving sources are not entirely clear. Sometimes these individuals are listed as sons of the former monarch, but sometimes they're listed as related but not in a father-son relationship, with the successor acting as a co-regent, 
and in some sources the dates are not certain and there is overlap. Given that this was close to 3,000 years ago, and as the video title hopefully makes clear, other civilizations, like the Greeks, did not know about this one, and thus it doesn't make it into surviving texts from antiquity, the fact that modern archaeologists know anything about this at all is frankly amazing, never mind the fact that specialists can read the language. In any case, during the reign of Argisti I, the kingdom expands to incorporate Lake Savan and arguably reached its maximum territorial extent, and became a major military power in the ancient Near East. However, between 781 and 774 BC, right in the middle of Argisti's reign, the Assyrians launched at least six campaigns against Urartu, and the end results were perhaps not outright defeats for the Assyrians, but certainly military frustrations, and for the next five decades with Assyrian power weakened, Urartu became the main player in the area. This situation, however, did not last. In 745 BC, approximately in the middle of the reign of Sarduri II, Tiglath Pelesar III became king of Assyria. Using a series of mountain passes and roads, he invaded Urartu and not only defeated Sarduri II on the battlefield, but he reached Lake Van and he burned the capital of Tushpa. Sargon II, reigning between 722 and 705 BC, either inherited the Assyrian throne legitimately or overthrew Shalemneser V in a coup. Assyriologists are not sure on the matter, and neither is it certain if Sargon and Shalemneser were brothers, and thus sons of Tiglath Pelesar III, or if just one of them was a son. Either way, Sargon took over rulership of Assyria, and then he launched a war against Urartu, defeating an army and taking a statue of the chief Urartian god, Haldi, captive while also attacking and burning Musasir, the city so central to the Urartian religion. Believing that their gods had abandoned them, in part due to the failure to protect the statue of Haldi, the Urartian king Rusa took his own life in 714 BC. In the intervening 60 years between his death and the start of Sarduri III's reign in 645 BC, Urartu was at peace with Assyria and they began to be raided by Chimerians, nomads from the Eurasian steppe, and then eventually, Scythians. The Urartians don't appear to have been able to protect themselves against either group effectively, and they possibly became vassals or semi-vassals of the Assyrians. Ultimately though, none of this is clear. We know extremely little of this period outside of a general king list, and some military activity. There were, apparently, two kings after Sarduri III whose reigns extended into the 590s or maybe the 580s, but that's really all we know. In the end, Urartu faded. Its power broken by the Assyrians and weakened by raids and destruction from the steppe. We don't know for certain how the civilization met its end, but many ruins do show evidence of fire and destruction. While nomadic raids are documented, it's also probable that as order and governmental structures broke down, there was rioting and violence conducted by the Urartian population against their rulers. During all of this, Assyria itself suffered a civil war, and in their weakened state they came under attack by the Medians, the Scythians, and a revived Neo-Babylonian state, effectively ending Assyria as a power, and in the process, the Urartians militarily and politically met their end as well. Their great mountain fortresses would be abandoned, and many of their cities would be depopulated, left to be swallowed by the sands of time. 